Hi there. This is a response to a video by Hysterical Hamza, Hamza Andreas Zortus, in which he once again tries to pull the wool over people's eyes by twisting, turning, misrepresenting, lying, pretending, and simply bullshitting to make the Quran better than it is. Humble Hamza has released this video on a topic some might find absolutely boring by now, science and revelation embryology in the Quran. I, for one, am so thoroughly bored with this by now, I ignored it, because there is no embryology in the Quran. But it's only creation. But I was asked to make a comment, so I suppose I'll spend a few minutes on this. It's our usual world champion brain contortionist trying to sell his usual primitive ideas to unsuspecting fellow Muslims, who don't check or challenge anything they hear in hopeless Hamza's lengthy monologues. Histrionic Hamza this time comes up with a notion that science only produces iPhones or tablets. His shallow mind does not conceive of possible errors due to him totally ignoring research, observation and measurement. He says that science is inaccurate and merely speculative. Why? Well, because science can't prove science. And promptly proceeds to tell us that the Quran is of divine origins. Why? Because the Quran says so. Uh, how many face palms is that worth? Okay, so let's go and take a look at the video itself. So it starts off with the, with the usual intro into science and immediately it's a flawed approach because he claims science is not the only way to understand nature. Because science is not the only way to form conclusions about man, life and the universe. Does he give us an alternative? Yeah, the Quran. <laughs> He says that science is only applications. In other words, it gives you iPhones, iPads or, or medicine or something, and then tells us how wonderful, unchanged and explicit the Quran is. And then seven minutes into the video, he plays stupid games, questioning what is around Earth, making photos not trustworthy. Would you believe me just because I showed you an image? and showing his own ignorance. No, it does not take climbing up on a mountain to see that Earth is spherical. It's not round, it's spherical. You can do your own experiments, but then they would be scientific. Yes, you can verify it. And amazingly, science has come up with something completely different. You can go into something called Spaceship One or, or any one of these crafts to go out and take a look for yourself. But that's too complicated. Now we get good reasons why the Quran is right and why our own view might be wrong. Like Muhammad is more real than our own mother. Has he never heard of something called DNA? Oh, can it get worse? I mean, the lack of knowledge and total ignorance of anything scientific is mind boggling. And, and now here we get a glimpse of the real hardened Hamza, a despotic and choleric person who says he goes everywhere and atheists are hecklers. Every time I go everywhere, in many universities, I always have people heckling me, especially atheists. And, and remember in the, in the video, pre previous video, um, I already pointed out how Hamza can be very, very different. How can, he can be very cold and like when he told Professor Hoodboy, I don't care. You can address it later, not my problem. This is reality. Anyway, now we go, we're only 10 minutes into the video where he speaks about the Quran and the, the Hadiths and how they verify everything. But now, if the people were asked to ponder and reflect on the contents of the Quran, how is this possible when the Quran wasn't even finished? I mean, imagine you've had two or three chapters um, which are out and then at the end of the third chapter it says go and ponder over the Quran. Does that make sense? No. It does make sense however if humans wrote it later. Now he says that science has done bad things because it has made advancements that are against our intuition, morals and humanity. How can science do something? Can a hammer lying on a table get up and kill someone? No. So why and how can science? It is a tool, you tool. He wants moral filters for science. 
Like moral filters stop the guy in Toulouse from killing people? Like moral filters are keeping Muslims out of jails? <laughs> nah, come on. Now he slams old style science because he calls it ambiguous and <laughs> calls the contents of the Quran teleological, which in his eyes means it makes you think. <laughs> No, it does not. It just tells you there's a final cause or design or purpose. Oh, goodness. The Quran, in terms of its verses, are teleological, which basically means in the, in the language of philosophy that it's there to make you think. Now, after 18 minutes, we are told that the Muslim science, not Arab science, it's Muslims, because all science comes from the Quran, which he has previously told us is purely speculative. But here, it's, now it's good because the Toledo Muslims, that for him are, are the height of, of scientific development in the 13th century, they are the basis for all science. I mean, this, this hip, it's so hypocritical where he's first slamming unreliable um, science and, and then he bases everything on this and, and says this is the, the, the entire definition of science. And then he brings us a definition not by a scientist but a philosopher and telling us what science does not actually what it is so why not just say it's a disciplined way to study the natural world using observation testing experimentation and measuring why why, why come with all this other nonsense and now and this is quite interesting he slams the old style science in the quran again um, because he says it is ambiguous he says that um, you know all this this big bang egg shaped and all that um, that this is actually not the right way to do it but science is speculative anyway and then after 23 minutes he tells us and now this is a real good uh, skepticism means there is no truth called skepticism and what is skepticism? It basically means doubt everything, or it means that there is no truth. <laughs> he misunderstands the definition totally and completely. No idea what is going on. But again, he repeats that the Quran does not negate any established fact or reality. But scientific conclusion, now that is not a fact. Now, if a scientific conclusion is not a fact, why does he, a minute later, tell us that what is established fact is that the sky is blue or green? Now, how can you establish that the sky is blue if you're not using science? You have to explain the color blue as being a wavelength and what is being reflected by what and where to make it look as though the sky is blue is science. <laughs> and it's not mentioned in the Quran. The Quran does not say the sky is blue because. So, yeah. Anyway. He then goes into the question of how do you establish that Earth is round or flat? I mean, it's spheric. It's not round. It's spherical. Ah. And he, he says that the Quran can go against science, but not establish facts. How do you get that right? Well, he says science is useless. It cannot prove itself. Well, actually it can, because it's got something built in which enables science to falsify itself, which means that if you cannot falsify it, it is true. Then he says it cannot prove maths. Well, actually it can, because if you take um, a cow and another cow, then that's two cows, and you can scientifically prove that one cow is more than two cows. So this is also wrong. Then he says it cannot prove morals. And again, actually science can prove it. And it can show what morals are. And it can determine morals. But helpless Hamza starts lying now because he says science is limited to our five senses. And helpless Hamza has no clue what he's talking about. But he does so anyway, very loudly. He forgets about x-rays and ultrasound and, and all other senses. He does not know anything about this, but he talks about it anyway. In fact, now, after 27 minutes, he calls science scientism. He loves adding that ism at the end. Oh, goodness. He calls it amoral, where science is a tool. Why does he not understand it? People utilize science. 
making applications immoral or not. It is not a worldview or a religion. Ah. Now he goes into established reality again and after 30 minutes we are now into what he was trying to talk about all the time, which is the development of the human embryo. We get the usual three sentences he knows in Arabic and a lot of rambling. So many minutes later he arrives at the process, he calls it a process, nutfa. I mean nutfa is a word, all right? It, it means a clot, it means a blood clot, it means a clinging clot, whatever. But it's all a process, it just is, it's a noun. But he does some abracadabra, correlates it with other verses, comes up with a hundred meanings and suddenly it means it's the male and female gametes which are mingled. Which you find in Galen's two semens, where the female produces some sort of semen too. Ah, but Galen does not use the word nutfa, so he must be talking about something completely different. And now note how Hamza always uses and hides behind the word nutfa, never clarifying which of the many meanings he actually means. Now, hilarious Hamza now goes off into other types of established facts, the miracles. They transcend science, which makes them possible. And making a human from clay is perfectly acceptable, natural even, because it's his God doing it. And he's not using any clay, but very specific clay, from a very specific clay pit, with this very specific clay. What is it? Where is it? No answer. But modern science, whatever that may mean, is good enough again to extract the knowledge about the composition of humans and the corresponding clay. Hey, it's only speculative, remember? But now why on earth does this clever book never mention that humans are not clay, but carbon-based? Alright, now let's look at some basics. In the beginning I said that there is no embryology in the Quran. Why did I say this and why is my statement correct? Well, embryology is the scientific study of human formation, early growth and development from the gametes to the fully formed fetus. What is essential and what we can't do without, as anyone knows, is the sperm, not, not the semen, but the sperm. And then you need the ovum or egg and the process of these two cells merging or fertilization. And then this zygote then multiplies into a blastocyst and then it attaches itself to the uterus wall via an umbilical cord and is being fed by the placenta. Now subtract any one of these components and you have nothing other than some dead cells. Does this qualify as established fact? Is any of this found in the Quran? No. All we get there is clay, blood, flesh, bones, assembled by a god. It's known as creation, not science. But hopeless Hamza ignores all of this, rejects science and declares his version established fact. How this is possible remains a mystery. How one gets from scientific conclusions to established fact is not explained either. And hilarious Hamza trips over this himself later on several times. And it's funny how the Quran is suddenly profound when we correlate it with modern science which, as he's just told us, is merely speculative. Now we get medical terms galore, and then at the end, one tiny Arabic word, insinuating that this one word is a kind of a placeholder for the books he's just quoted. Remember at the beginning he mentioned the old-fashioned retrospective analysis? Well, the same is happening here. The knowledge of today is projected to make sense of an old, vague, imprecise and ambiguous book. And I think a cleric really needs to have a serious word with this guy. He constantly forgets to call Allah, Allah SWT or Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Well, how careless. Also, why does no Muslim ever ask why he uses the conditional so much? Hamza is constantly saying this can mean or could happen or would. Or why is he never precise and accurate? And as per usual, Hamza clings to words and does not understand the meaning or the concept. He shows images of embryos when he's just told us that images mean shit. He mentions book after book, author after author, all specialists in their fields. 
did none of them during their years of study come across the Quran with its profound knowledge, which would make it a living miracle today if it were true? How come real life embryologists laugh at Keith Moore and his hijacked book? This shows that reading up a few internet pages and a couple of books does not give you the knowledge to compete with real life scholars, teachers and professors. But Hamza bravely ignores this and says his nonsensical trivia is, well what he likes to think, peer reviewed. So he rattles off some names of institutions and people saying this is what he, Hamza, calls peer review. Oh boy. Does he tell us what they said? No. Do we get access to the results? Nope. Does he give us the link to the publication? No. Does he let us in on the selection criteria? No. Well, all we learn is that a guy who translates classic books, like the first chapter of the Quran, says it is sound. There, that's it. Clench it. Reviewed and found to be sound. I need to stop listening to this high-pitched excited voice feeding people total superstitious nonsense because I drop several IQ points every single time. Okay, we're now 49 minutes into the video and now he... <laughs> that's really too stupid. He says, PZ Myers substi substantiates his view. This is, what is stupidity squared? I mean, PZ makes fun of Hamza and Hamza only sees a single word and he's happy without reading the sentence or the paragraph or the whole intention behind it. Oh dear. And now he starts answering every possible contention. Oh, really? Well, he contorts words and what he has to do is frantically look for publications mentioning his three keywords, which he has handpicked from the selection of possible translations because he already knows what he wants to look for and what the result needs to be. What a dishonest tactic. Well, now I know that there are uneducated and primitive Muslims out there who lap up these falsehoods unquestioned. But isn't it exactly knowing this that should stop a person, even one with low moral standards, from doing this? Hmm, not so, Hamza. I get so sick and tired of Hamza saying this conforms with that and it proves the Quran. Uh, and 50 milliseconds later, he goes on, but this could also refer to, and now it's something completely different. But they all conform with the word mentioned in the Quran. So no matter what it says, the Quran is always right. Well, after 55 minutes, we've arrived at the last point, the bones. There's a, a lot of science again, which well, it can't be correct because it is not established reality. Hamza again catches himself out using science for an established fact in our real world. And then something interesting at, at the one hour mark, suddenly there's a break. What is so unimportant? Was it a mistake or what is he hiding? <sighs> our helpless, hopeless Hamza. Now we talk about other forms, um, which again, runs into speculative science and how people who say that um, the Quran, well, no, actually the, how Muhammad copies the Greeks is wrong. Because now we get the emotional argument that Muhammad was not a liar. Please, no, he cannot have been a liar. Because he in his childish naivete assumes that the sentences which were later collected to make up the Quran were solely dictated by Muhammad who in turn received them privately from an angel without any proof, without anybody ever seeing this. And nobody has heard from an angel made from light, which can talk. Oh well, whatever. The state of the art knowledge regarding medicine and embryology was Greek medicine, which we know today was wrong. Does the Quran, does, does this God who wrote the book ever say, well, I'm going to tell you something different because I'm going to tell you how it really works? No. So now, after 1 hour 11, again, we go into the meaning of the Quran. And no, suddenly it is Muhammad who says it's male and female. So now Hamza is just mixing up Hadith and Quran. What a God is supposed to have said and what humans said. Anyway, this entails that Muhammad rejected what was wrong because he was the author of the text. But wasn't the Muslim God the author? 
who should have known what was right and wrong and he should be the one knowing exactly how he creates people why doesn't he explain it properly and then after one and a quarter hour hamza lies he says galen writes that the two semens mix just as mentioned in Utfa, and then mixes with menstrual blood the alaka and the quran and he says this is never mentioned in any shape or form. This is not mentioned in the Quran anyway, in any shape or form. I don't understand why he does this. Anybody can look this up. Alaka has always been translated as a clot of blood, except by Yusuf Ali, who inserts the leech like. If we go into 22, 23, 40, 75, it's always a clot of blood. Now, the Quran does not mention the blood in any shape or form, but I suppose helpless Hamza will now claim he said menstrual blood, which indeed is not mentioned in the Quran. But the God does say that he is the one who shapes people in the womb. So this God thinks there should be conjoined twins and babies with any type of deformation anyone can think of. Well, congratulations. But now hang on. Which version used in the Quran do we believe? Because we have, he's only created from dust, then semen, clot, and that's it, baby. Or should we look at 23, where we have a different form and more details? Or is it 80 in verses 19 FF from a drop of semen and then the path is smooth and then he makes him die and puts him in his grave is this one better than the ones above also we have 11 or 12 different materials which are used to create humans which one should we take all a sample none who decides and what is interesting is that hamza has problems typing he's very sloppy his academic verlag is actually academy verlag I mean, it's a petty point, I know, but it reflects the general attitude to precise research. And please remember, hapless Hamza is paid to do this. This is his job. If I were this sloppy in my job, I would not last a day. And another example, one of his sources, a Christos Similidis, criticizes the Quran and Hamza asks why he did not mention Galen and the similarities. Well. Similidis is making fun of the early Muslims in his capacity of scholar of literature and linguistics. He brings together different translations and commentaries to show his conclusion on the concept of a compact God. Is he a medical doctor? No. Does he need to know what Galen taught? No. So why does Hamza say that this not mentioning Galen substantiates the correctness of the Quran? Nobody will ever know or understand what goes on inside that sparsely populated brain. If I go and mention oil, a fourth gear, indicator, and a mirror, and I say this refers to the complete and accurate creation of a car, because the oil can mean this, this, and this, and means obviously it means the engine. The fourth gear is a clear pointer that the gearbox, which everybody knows is necessary, is attached to the engine. The indicator means the electrical system is installed and the driver can now show the path he will take and communicate with other drivers and the mirror can only be there if the interior is complete as well. So these four words describe the entire process of putting together a car from various materials and components. And that's how ridiculous <laughs> and that's how ridiculously stupid it is. If someone now were to point out that gearboxes were known a hundred years earlier, Hamza would retort that those only had three gears and would rattle off a number of books, all saying that gearboxes were sold with three gears. And hapless Hamza would completely ignore the concept of a gearbox, but concentrate only on the words three gears. And this is what he calls addressing possible contentions. And this is why I always burst out laughing when I hear him use words that are completely alien to him, academic and intellectual. In summary, I think I can safely say there is no embryology in the Quran. All it says is that a God created everything and gullible people need to believe it. There are some words all over the book referring to the creation of humans, none describing a process, but just single words. 
In fact, there is nothing of any scientific value in the Quran, which represents the knowledge of the people of the 7th century in Arabia. And this is why nobody has ever quoted the Quran as being accurate in anything remotely factual or scientific. And as a very clever gentleman said, science does not make it impossible to believe a God exists. It just makes it possible to not believe a God exists. Thank you for your time.